So I, I only specialize in spine. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, pretty much anything from the base of your skull uh, going all the way down to the uh, pelvis. Um, and we can talk about some of these several concepts, you know, spinal deformity, so also known as scoliosis surgery, or uh, the deformities that develop in adults as a result of other problems, whether it's cancer or somebody else's uh, prior underlying surgery. And minimally, minimally invasive procedures, you know, it's such a buzzword these days, it's actually hard to define what that is. Uh, obviously, every doctor likes to tell their patients that they do things uh, as uh, uh, less invasively as possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a topic of this discussion. If you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them for you. And that cervical was fine. So uh, when this talk was arranged, uh, we had to obviously narrow it down. So I decided this time to talk about the neck, which doesn't mean that's the only thing I am seeing. Deal with. So, if there's any specific questions you may have regarding other parts of the spine, uh, I feel fairly comfortable to answer those. So, uh, let's go to the next thing. We got, I got a couple of fun things. Obviously, we're in Silver Cross. Uh, so, some of the places that I actually did surgery at, and I put Silver Cross sort of as, a, you know, as an outlier in this other scheme. So, we just got back from Poland about uh, 10 days ago. Uh, this is my hometown. I was born and raised there. We have a little nonprofit, and you'll see that on the next slide. We'll where um, we go around to different places that have their underserved and uh, perform spinal procedures. So that's how I ended up in Kampala, Uganda, which is the bottom right. If some of you have seen The Last King of Scotland, the movie, it's a very good movie that takes place in Kampala, Uganda. That's exactly the hospital in which the movie took place. And I've actually uh, uh, did a couple of surgeries in Dubai. So there are a lot of different uh, contrasts. Uh, next slide, please. This is our. Uh, Organization Judy, uh, who you may have met back there, is uh, also involved. She's on the board. She takes care of our PR work. Uh, so uh, what we do is we go to various places. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Anel in the middle, and uh, him, him here. And some of you may have seen him. Uh, he um, also goes to Cali, Colombia. Uh, so we trip to twice a year, January and July, and then uh, spring and fall for the Colombia trips. Mainly deal with kids with uh, bad deformities and children. Next slide. You can skip over to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, so, getting into the talk, I think it's very important in all settings to know, to develop the language and ability to communicate. As you know, in medicine, there's a lot of different words. Some of them sound foreign, some of them are foreign. Uh, and doctors, and I think myself included, fall into the trap of just using words that patients may not understand. So I like to start every talk with just what are we talking about or the definition so that there's not so much of a language barrier, right? Because I could be speaking almost a foreign language if you're not familiar with the terms. Once again, a lot of you may have had a report in your hand with an MRI or x-ray and you'll read the report and there's a lot of words and some of them may sound concerning and you don't know what the other ones mean. So uh, at that point, uh, people become very uh, concerned, right? So spondylosis is the first one. Uh, anything with the word S-P-O-N-D-Y, spondy, means it pertains to the spine. So you may hear things like spondylosis, spondylolisthesis. So once again, spondy, it's actually the material bodies of spine. And then the, in this case, olisthesis means <coughs> slip, okay? So anything with the prefix spondy, well, it's this one. Uh, Milo actually has two meanings. I put one up there because it's of interest to us. Milo means spinal cord, but it also means blood. Okay, so you can have like a myelodysplasia, it could be a disease of the blood. So, but it means two things, just to make it more confusing. But when you're in a spine person's office, Milo it will be implied to mean spinal cord. Pathy, any kind of pathy is just a disease. Okay. So a radic, radicular path, radiculopathy. Radix means root, all right? So disease of the root, in this case, disease of the nerve root. Right? So if somebody has high radiculopathy, pain radiating down the arm, it's because the nerve root is being uh, uh, diseased for whatever reason. Obviously, the reasons are various, and we're going to get into that. I have somatic pain. What does that mean? Soma. Soma means body. Soma means body, the soma of the cell, body of the cell. And then radiculitis. 
So I told you a dick means root, itis. So itis means inflammation. Right? So that goes for a lot of different body parts as well, right? tendonitis. Okay. Next, please. So I think what works best is we talk about a, a, just a general patient that you may know somebody like this. So this is a, a middle-aged uh, man uh, who showed up with neck pain because he was lifting heavy objects over a very common problem, right? You've been doing something for 30 years and then your 31st year and second day you lift the same thing and your neck is <coughs> hurting. He doesn't have any uh, arm pain and no history of arm pain. I'll tell you why that's important. Next slide, please. So this person shows up in my office. I do one of the doctors that they do, right, in the office. And there's a lot of questions that uh, an individual has. So what do I got? Why am I hurting, right? So anytime you want to treat somebody, you have to back up and know what you're treating, right? So the number one and most important thing is the diagnosis. You have to obtain the diagnosis. So it's very, very important. So what is the diagnosis? Why does this man have the problem? It seems simple, but I think we get caught up in all the other things and fail to identify the problem. Well, once they know what it is, how long does it take you to get better, right? And for neck pain, even simple cause, right? Gardening, lifting something, it could take longer than you wish. Right? So everybody wants to get better quick, but it could be anywhere from a couple of weeks to three, four, five months after something that's benign, still feel, right? What do I do if we don't, if we don't get better, right? So obviously there's this element of follow-up, so you see the doctor, they make a diagnosis, make some recommendations and then you follow up in the office, let's say you come back four weeks, you're still hurting, not a lot, all right? What do we do? And that's the time when we start looking at getting more imaging, more diagnostics, right? So for somebody with neck pain, to then improve with time, well, it may be reasonable to get an x-ray, MRI, those kinds of things. And what are the concerning findings? So what it is that I'm worried about when you show up in my office? To you, the neck pain may be the worst neck pain of your life. Obviously, I can't feel it. So, not that neck pain is not as concerning, but a combination of neck pain and other findings may be very concerning. So, just to list a few. If you have pain shooting down the arm, all the way down, into the hand and the fingers, that may be consistent with some kind of nerve irritation in your neck. To me, that's a bigger problem. I probably will do more things quicker, okay? If you have any kind of weakness associated with this, you know, you can't do this, you can't lift a gallon of milk, you can't lift a coffee, I'm worried, okay? If you have numbness in your hands and you never had it before, well, it could be just carpal tunnel, no big deal, right? Maybe not, maybe the question is a uh, finding consistent with compression of the spinal. If your balance is up, you get neck pain, next thing you know, you're walking like you're drunk. Get the hole the, against the wall. I'm very worried about it, okay? When it comes to the cervical spine, the structure that is most precious is your spinal cord, all right? Any kind of irritation, pressure, damage, anything that disrupts that main nerve, which essentially connects your brain to everything, heart, lungs, hands, legs, uh, can result in, in, you know, not only significant findings, but a significant problem for you as a patient. So, next slide, please. <coughs> so, this guy got an MRI, right? So, what ended up happening is neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, doesn't get better with time, and we'll go into new ways of managing that. So I got an MRI. As in most cases, most, most, most cases, the MRIs are benign, right? If you read the report from the radiologist, it doesn't look benign. There's all these things, C1, C2, C3, they list all the levels, they'll find something mild, moderate, this and that. But looking for, from my perspective, I mean a surgical perspective, most of these things have age-related appropriate degenerative changes. So let's go for the MRI, right? So if you go to the doctor's office, that's a specialist, I don't expect your primary care doctor to do this, but if you're seeing somebody like myself, uh, you sh and obviously you're being treated and you have this MRI, you know, do not leave, thank you. Like you. Right. Uh, do not leave without seeing your image. Right. So it's every doctor's responsibility to review this with you. Those two things. One, you feel comfortable with what's going on, and two, you know for a fact the doctor's reviewing your imaging, okay? Uh, doctor's busy people, you gotta make sure the right name's in the folder, right? 
always helps to pay attention to these things. Um, and the fact that, yes, yeah, somebody did look at your online, not just the report. The reports can be misleading. If you look at who reads the reports, right, so you look at the bottom of the page, who, who's the doctor reading? Sometimes it's a chiropractor. And nothing against chiropractors, but, you know, do they have the same training for reading MRIs? I don't know. Uh, I do two things. One, I read the report, because there, that's always another pair of eyes, but I always make my own decisions based on how it affects you, because the radiologist does not see you, does not examine you, does not hear your story. You know, maybe you did have a fusion five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and he's reading it as some congenital problem, right? So, we don't know that. So, once again, this is the easiest view to understand, which is looking at your neck from the side. So, essentially like this, the cut through the middle, all right? Spinal cord, so the most important structure that travels through your neck. All right, without it, you cannot walk. In front and behind the spinal cord, you see these lighter gray areas, which are actually cerebrospinal fluid. So it's a fluid that bathes uh, all your nerves from all the way to your brain, all the way down. All right, so it's manufactured in your brain and then goes down this tube and bathes your spinal cord. What you want to see is always fluid in front and behind your spinal cord. You don't want to see any disruptions. And I'll show you an example of that in uh, future slides. These are the bones. So those are the vertebral bodies. They look like boxes. They're stacked one on top of the other, right? And in between them are the discs, so the cushion absorbs. Here, 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 here. Very frequently you'll see your MRI report and they'll say intervertebral disc degeneration. Severe. What does that mean? Maybe nothing. What I like to tell people is think of a disc as a grape that turns into a raisin as you ate in every bone. Alright? So it's this large fluid filled structure which is soft and spongy, which becomes dehydrated, right? And is not so spongy, it's not as confined. So discs with age will wear out. Alright? So they will lose water content, they will lose their shock absorbing capabilities. But it's normal. That doesn't mean it's a pathologic state. Doesn't mean you have to end the PATHY to the end of it, all right? So this is what I would expect a 52-year-old male to write to. So why does he have pain, right? Who am I pointing this at? Things to remember about back pain. So this is just uh, a generalized list of things in your neck that can cause pain. Muscles, ligaments, joints, nerve tissues, veins, bone, everything that has an innervation is a potential pain generator, right? I think everybody turns to focus on the disc because there's so much that we said about it, so much uh, publicity about the disc, so everybody automatically assumes that the disc is the source of pain. And in some instances it certainly is, but there's a lot of other things that are going on uh, that can cause uh, neck pain. So this is why diagnosing it in somebody with a normal MRI is such a uh, dilemma, right? Because muscles, ligaments, veins, dura, nerves will look normal on an MRI in somebody that has pain while they may be the pain generator. Chris, there's some out that's um, a laser pointer. Laser pointer. All right, so <laughs> you just got to tell me, Chris. All right, just press the button. Yeah. Um, next, next slide. Yeah, there we yeah. go. So what ends up happening is, if you develop, for instance, some rare injury, right, and you have a, what's called a whiplash injury, your right eye on whiplash. What is? Why is that hurt? And why does it look normal in MRI? Well. I listed the things that can cause pain. For instance, in a whiplash injury, what ends up happening is that little joints in your neck are surrounded by soft tissue. The soft tissue stretches. The soft tissue has nerves. Think about stretching your skin. At some point, it's going to start hurting and you start pulling on it, right? Well, similar principle here, whether it's ligament, tissue, that muscle, uh, these uh, capsules around these joints, once you start stretching them past the limit, past their normal physiologic limit, which they can tolerate, you get pain. But you cannot see it on the end. That's why it's uh, diagnosis so tricky and the treatment tricky and then explaining to the patient is also difficult because it's a lot easier to understand something you can see versus something you can't see. When you get a diagnosis, 
I, I'm not a huge advocate of using Dr. Google, but what I do in the <laughs> office, because we have uh, like many other people in internet access, is I like to show them what the pain patterns can be. All right, so I have to show patients, for instance, you have a C5, C6 disc herniation, what is the pain pattern associated with that? And they're like, oh wow, that's exactly what I got. Because what you'll find is that when you ask people to describe the location of their pain, some will be able to say, oh, it's going all the way down my arm and to this finger. A lot of people can do that. Certain people cannot. They cannot voice it because they may be having a better day. You know, it's always when you're at the doctor's you're feeling better. So that, that, that's what may be going. This particular the diagram is actually the pain patterns for the little joints in the back of your neck. So those are the areas that are harder to see on MRI. Okay? But as you can see, it's a all the way from the surface, from the top of the cervical spine and down to the bottom of the, of the neck, different areas are represented uh, by uh, these uh, patterns. Next, please. All right. So, once again, you're the middle-aged person, uh, or younger, older, that has uh, a problem, usually neck pain. We talked about no arm pain, right? So just focal neck pain, whether it was a because of lifting, or you overdid it, or you were starting, whatever. What are your treatment options? Okay. So the way I look at treatment options are for essentially all spine conditions. Right. Treatment options can fall into just several categories. Number one is you do nothing. Okay. That's an option. Never forget. Right. So doing nothing is actually an option. And sometimes it may be the best option. Option number two involves non-invasive conservative management. What does that mean? Your physical therapies, your chiropractor, uh, your heat, your cold, your massage, those kinds of things. Then you have more invasive conservative management. So there is a step up. So I'm giving you a prog not, you know, progressive letter of increased uh, uh, complexity. So invasive conservative management, what is that? Injections. Everybody sort of wants to go injection, right? Well, it's not a benign thing to have an epidural injection, right? There's a needle that's going around your nerves. The other thing that's also invasive that you don't think about is acupuncture, right? So acupuncture also penetrates the skin. Anytime you have penetration of skin, there's a risk profile. So that's the second tier. Uh, and then the last tier is obviously surgery, right? So surgery is very rare, and very few people actually, out of the whole population of people with pain, are surgical candidates. So for this man, pure neck pain, hit the button on the This is just a general regimen of things I would probably recommend. Time and rest. If you look at all the scientific evidence, what has been shown to be most effective for somebody with neck pain as a, uh, as a result of a work-related injury or as a result of uh, an injury uh, at all, minor injury, obviously, time and rest are the most important. And the third component, which I do not include, is education. Meaning you tell the individual that, hey, listen, you don't have that big of a problem, this will get better with time. Anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, you know, these things are over the counter, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, you relieve Motrin, Mobix, uh, Advil's. That's a family of anti-inflammatory medications. They're not benign. So if you've been taking uh, schedule, meaning every eight hours, uh, Advil at a therapeutic dose, which is three of those little pills, 600 milligrams, at approximately three weeks, just a little bit less than three weeks, your kidney function will start to decrease. Very important to keep in mind. Everybody harps on the fact that it may irritate your uh, stomach and you can get an ulcer. That's actually a little bit more controversial now, but I'm not a primary care doctor, so, you know, but the, 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 the fact is that you have to understand that long-term use of these medications is risky. Yes, ma'am. First question. Take it every day or? So this is, this is every day, around the clock, every eight hours, 600 milligrams. Now, you have to understand that this is a study. That doesn't mean that you are noticing this. Meaning these are like healthy volunteers who were popping pills for three weeks in a row around the clock, and they took their blood every whatever day, two days. So what's their volume? Most people, yeah. I know, listen, there are people that obviously have been taking this stuff long term because it works, right? They, their options are limited. They don't want to have surgery. They don't want to have an injection, but Advil or ibuprofen works, mm -hmm. so they take it a long time, months, sometimes years. Right? So when you're one of those individuals, what I tell patients is very critical to take a break, which is obviously easier said than done, uh, for at least you know seven to ten days of complete off 
non-steroidals, and you can replace that with acetaminophen, so like an animal type of medication, which obviously has its own problems related to liver function, right? So anything you do in access will bite you, right? Physical therapy. So what's the what's the party line of physical therapy? What is physical therapy anyway, right? So I don't know. I really don't. You, I send a patient to a therapist. Therapist does whatever therapists do. The patient comes back. Now, if I had ten therapists lined up here, I show them that MRI, that diagnosis, you will get ten different treatments. Okay. But physical therapy is a blanket statement word for what happens in a therapy place. Okay. There's been no shown advantage to any one particular type of therapy over the other. So there's no magical exercise that's better than the rest. Or obviously, I wouldn't be telling you what I told you. You have a, co a, a solid protocol uh, for, you know, for, a so for, for a diagnosis. Obviously, all these things involve a combination of range of motion strengthening, uh, which is progressive in nature, meaning the more you can tolerate, the more uh, they let you do. What about chiropractic? So I personally don't have any problems with people going to a chiropractor. It just depends on your diagnosis. Right? Uh, also de depends on what the chiropractor does. So that's one of those other things. What does a chiropractor do? I've been to maybe two guys' offices, but there's a lot of them, and people, you know, they have different philosophies and do things differently. Uh, what I think can be problematic is if you do have pressure on the nerves, for whatever reason, and you have your head manipulated. You always hear about big people cracking your neck or that can actually result in a fairly catastrophic injury. What does that mean paralysis? Now the chance is very, very, very small. I'm not telling you that, you know, even people that are at risk uh, have a very small chance of that happening, but not zero. I think it's just an unnecessary risk and I will certainly recommend against having your neck manipulated uh, if you have a, a condition that affects the nerves, the pressure on the nerves. So that's for treatment for somebody with just neck. We've made like three slides into this stuff. <coughs> You're lucky. You have one so we already defined this. So uh, root and disease of the root. In this case, disease of nerve root. Next. All right. This is Dave. You kind of know this guy. He's a Chicago police officer. All right. So this guy's in his late 40s. Um, he's in a squad car downtown. T-bones somebody that ran a stop sign while they were chasing him. And he has this as a result. So I labeled the area, uh, C for cervical, six, the number for the sixth vertebra, and the big white arrow is pointing to whatever point you can hopefully see is a, is a big disc bulge. And this is the MRI. So that's the picture I showed you before in terms of the sequence of so looking from the side. And then I'm introducing another view, uh, which is looking down the tube through which the nerves travel. And uh, you can see that this is this disc herniation. Just to make things confusing for people, this is not the left side, it's the right side, and this is the left, so it's a mirror image, okay? And uh, just some other structures, so I told you this is the spinal cord, and that's what it corresponds to here, and you can see it's actually a little deformed. I told you this was forward and front and behind the spinal cord, this is what that is. Uh, this is your vertebral artery, so the artery uh, that's applied is actually a cause of stroke, but you have a plaque that forms there and shoots into your brain, fortunately that's not that um, not common in somebody in his age, but it's something you have to look at and evaluate. If you have a patient that has bad uh, arteries that you need surgery on, I think you could potentially uh, risk that. So those are all the things that I look at. So Dave happens to have arm pain. Okay? So this kind of condition can cause arm pain. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, a very nice uh, diagram of not Dave's neck. Uh, this is actually a kind of cadaveric specimen that shows you uh, the spinal cord here and how it's being compressed by this herniation, okay? This is where the nerves that go down your arms come out. Next slide, please. So why does it hurt? And this is another cross-section of uh, the disc actually pushing on her. So there's two things that are required to cause pain. Number one is the one everybody understands, is this big whopper of a disc, direct contact and pressure on a nervous structure. So that's not enough by itself. What actually ends up happening is you have an inflammatory response. So it's like pouring acid on your skin, okay? So that's what really, really, really is the irritant. Uh, so that's what causes the inflammation. You can actually have an MRI like Dave's that looks just like it, and the individual has no pain. So what very commonly actually happens is, uh, is this the next slide? Next slide. Yeah. 
So non-operative management of her herniated cervical vertebral disc. So what ends up happening very, very, very commonly, this is a common problem, uh, herniated disc in the neck. If you have a herniated disc in the neck, you have a 9 out of 10 chance of being completely pain-free, okay? usually within an 8 to 12 week period. So the first step in management is diagnosis, like I told you. Okay? So we know what we have, and then we know the history. So if you have a diagnosis, you can tell with confidence, hey, you have a herniated disc, you have a 9 out of 10 chance of feeling better, usually within the first few months. Obviously, nobody wants to wait three months, and that's why we send them to therapy, that's why we give them medication. Uh, and perhaps even an injection. But, like I said, can you go back? So, and one more. Yeah. One more. <clears throat> uh, so you can have this picture, this MRI, and a day that's completely pain free, but has a disc that looks like that. So just having pressure on the nerve, that's why I want to highlight, is not enough to cause symptoms. You need the inflammation. That's good. Come forward. So you saw this already once. So the first one I showed you is just for neck pain. This is neck pain with arm pain. Forward, please. Injections. So I included injections as I think a reasonable option for somebody with pain that's pain in the neck, pain in the arm, as a result of a disc burn. The first person I just pain in the neck and really didn't have any fun. So a lot has been said about injections. Uh, there are a lot of different types of injections. And there's a lot of different things that are injected. And the location. What is an epidural? That's the first thing you, you probably want to know. Uh, you know. Some ladies that have children may have had an epidural. Uh, is that the same thing that you're getting because you have back pain? Well, not really. So epidural is just a space. It's an anatomical term that denotes a space in your spine around the nerves. So when you're getting an epidural, what you're actually getting is a needle that injects something uh, around, into this potential space called the epidural space space there that can accept the fluid. You just don't inject it into the nerve or into that white fluid that I showed you. You've all probably heard of a spinal tap where you know some poor soul lays in the fetal position and they pull cerebral spinal fluid out. Very painful procedure. All right? Think of that as an epidural gone too far. Okay? So that's the next space down is that. So that's and sometimes people get a headache, right? So you may have heard of a dural headache. What ends up happening is once again this Individuals try to inject, inject the epidural space, they advance the needle too far, cerebral spinal fluid leaks out, you lose pressure, okay, because it, it's a fluid, so it holds pressure. Your brain actually sags and starts resting on structures. It's normally suspended by this buoyant, the buoyant in this fluid. That's why people get a headache. So it's an uh, uh, epidural headache. Drink some caffeine, lay it in bed, two days go by, watch a lot of TV, and they usually pass, all right? So that's the epidural. Next one, please. So, operative indication. So, when do people come and see me? Okay. So, failure of conservative management. That's a very broad term. That can mean a lot of different things, right? So, and what is failure? When have you failed? Right. When do you get the F right, in that department? So, first of all, conservative management is also a broad topic. And it's just doing PT conservative management. And if that doesn't work, would I fail? Well, I think you will run into different opinions here. So what does it mean for me is what I can tell you. For me, failure of conservative management is that you've tried everything short of surgery and you're not getting better, and a reasonable amount of time has passed. So I told you you have a 9 out of 10 chance if you have a herniated disc in your neck, you're going to improve in three months. Now, if three months have gone by and you're miserable, your chance of improving decreases. If six months have gone by, it decreases even further. If you had this for two years, you're probably less than 5% chance that it's going to go away on its own uh, if your symptoms are still significant. And if you've tried everything. So I have a spine surgeon friend uh, who uh, works at Rush, and he has a disc herniation. Okay? So he's actually a young guy. So what does he do for his disc herniation? Does he have surgery? This has been going on for four years. So I'll tell you if he has not had surgery for this. For a variety of reasons. One, he can still work and he can perform his activities of daily living. So to me, that's a cutoff. I ask patients, can you do what you need to do? Can you work, bathe, go shopping, take care of your family, take care of yourself? If you can do all those things and you're just a little annoyed with the arm pain, neck pain, eh, you're probably out of good surgical camp. 
uh, the guy I mentioned actually goes to a car. Okay. And swear to So I never argue with patients, that's another thing. If somebody tells me that something worked for them and it may be the craziest thing, I'll say that this works. Right thing for you. Progressive neurologic deficit. What does that mean? So neurologic deficit can mean a number of things. It means your reflex is out. So you know, the doctor taps you and your arm's not moving. You had it, let's say, in your prior visit, now you don't have it. That's a progressive, progressive neurologic deficit. Would I recommend surgery for somebody for that? No. You can do okay with that. Okay? What it's usually meant, though, is that you have weakness in one of your extremities that with time is getting worse. Once again, medicine's a tricky thing. What does it mean with time? When I woke up in the morning, I was fine. By 7 p.m., I couldn't move my arm. To me, that's a medical if in 1982 you could do this and now you can do it just a little less 40 or 30 years later, the progressive yes. Am I extremely concerned? I'm not gonna you know, send you out the door, but it's, we probably got some time. And then there's myelopathy. So I told you myelos means spinal cord in my world. Uh, and uh, the disease of the spinal cord is uh, an operative indication. Okay, so if you have a problem with your spinal cord, that's a, that's a true problem. It doesn't mean you need to go to the operating room that day, next day, but you should start thinking about uh, you know, having uh, some kind of surgical procedure. Next. Okay, so uh, case example. This is actually a very common condition. So once again, a guy in his 50s, uh, neck pain, no arm pain, no weakness, and no funny reflexes. Doctor taps the arms, legs, everything. Checks out okay. Uh, show that it makes like this. All right. So I'm going to explain the image a little. Before I showed you oh, a very healthy MRI, one that had a disc herniation, and now I'm showing you one that has a disc herniation pushing on the spinal cord at every level. Okay. So this is the other end of the spectrum. The spinal cord is being compressed. Some of you in the back will not see that, but you actually see these white streaks inside the spinal cord. Those mean that the spinal cord is unhealthy. It means that uh, there's a problem with either the blood flow there or is that dead um, nerve cells? I just include this CAT scan. So what is a CAT scan? CAT scan is just a fancy X-ray. Okay, so you've got abdominal CAT scan, neck, whatever. All they're doing is radiating you at exponentially higher rates than if you had a chest X-ray. Another thing to remember about an X-ray: it's radiation. Radiation is not healthy. How much radiation are you getting? And I don't want to go too far away from this topic, but I think you should be aware of this: is if you fly from New York to Los Angeles. You get the equivalent of a chest X ray radiation. Okay? So if you're a pilot or have a pilot, you know, it's an occupational hazard. Now, fortunately, chest X rays are very low radiation doses. A CAT scan is not. If somebody's having three, four CAT scans a year, they're very, very, very high risk for developing cancer uh, within that decade. Okay? So, and that's just becoming more recognized now. So, you know, it's easy for a doctor to boom, I'm going to order a CAT scan. Well, there has to be a lot of value to it. And it's one thing if you have one CAT scan a year. That's having actually two CAT scans of the body part a year um, you know, are tolerable. But if you have full chest, abdomen, and pelvis CAT scans pervading your whole body, I mean, that, that's, that's a significant amount of radiation. So if your physician's ordering CAT scans, you can just inquire that. You know, hey, you know, how many of these can I have a year? Is the radiation dose tolerable? You can also focus CAT scans for a specific body part. So those are just some things. But and the, the reason I ordered a CAT scan is anytime I see this type of a picture, I'm always worried there's more going on. In this uh, case, you see these white spots here. These means that there's calcification of bone formation in structures that should not have bone. Right? So that's called ossification of the ligament that runs down there. And to the patient, it doesn't really matter as much as it does to the treating doctor. Because as far as you're concerned, your problem is there and you want it God, this is not cancer or anything like that, but a surgeon that does not recognize this uh, may choose the wrong approach or the wrong surgery uh, for the patient. So this is a four-level problem, so multi-level problem uh, that is causing spinal cord compression. Spinal cord compression is where spinal cord is important. Myelopathy, to me, this is something that probably should consider undergoing surgery at some point. But I told you, this person, sorry, yes? It's more beneficial than the other. 
Okay, so that's a very good question. You mean CAT scan versus MRI? So they are, think of them, one as a lawnmower and one as a uh, snowblower, all right? They have wheels, they do things, but they serve a completely different function, all right? MRI is great at looking at soft tissue, great at looking at your nerves, all right? So you cannot see the same things on those two. I mean, you don't need, you know, you're seeing two different things here. CAT scan is excellent at bony structures. Right? Just like an x-ray, you can see bones, just think of it that way. So it's excellent at seeing solid structures. It shows you a lot of information. I'm sorry, the MRI shows you a lot of information, CAT scan does not, but it's missing that, that, that hard tissue piece to it, okay? So if I had to choose one versus the other, I, for the spine, I would choose an MRI over a CAT scan probably nine out of 10 times. So two different, two different imaging modalities answer two different questions, okay? So I told you this person is a very common problem. Why are they common? Because they, have a, they only have negative symptoms, right? I didn't, I didn't say anything about arm pain, no weakness, no numbness, no funny reflexes. So this individual comes in for neck, it doesn't get better. We don't get all these studies. Next thing you know, they have spinal cord compression, but they don't have any symptoms of it. So they're just walking around with spinal cord compression. What does that mean? Next slide, please. So this study looked at just that. And just next slide. Uh, what can we tell a patient that has normal function, some neck pain, and no spinal cord compression? Well, we can tell them that within about a four-year period, they have a, approximately a 25% chance of progressing to myelopathy, meaning so weakness, numbness, difficulty with gait, ambulation. So a serious problem. So once again, not that you need to go into the operating room right now, but we probably need to monitor you, observe you. You should be familiar with what the warning signs are. Is this man at increased risk of having a problem? Shall he be rear-ended? The answer is yes. Okay, there's less space in the nerves. Next slide. All right, uh, so this is uh, more obvious. Everything's wrong. Hand on the shoulder pain, problem with uh, walking, pathologic reflexes. Needing some, I'm very concerned at this point. First visit, MRI, x -ray. What is an x-ray show? So x-rays usually are done with the patient standing up for the spine. Uh, that way, the effects of gravity are shown. Uh, you can see if there's any instability in the spine. MRI is dying with, done with the patient laying in a flat bed, right? So things may go back into their original place. Uh, the alignment of the bones, which is critical, once again, for decision making, uh, is uh, seen. And sometimes we get these dynamic films where we ask people to flex and extend their necks. Uh, to see if there's any abnormal motion, which can uh, contribute to spinal cord compression. Next slide, please. So once again, I'm showing you another pretty bad image um, where there's compression of the neural structures of multiple levels. So in this individual, there's less time. The other guy just had neck pain. Statistically, they have about four years. Obviously, people are not a statistic. That's why we watch them. This woman probably has less time. She's noticing, you know, it's all about the history, how you talk to people. So when I ask her, have you noticed progression of your symptoms? She says, yes. Is it over 10 years, five years, three months, three weeks? You know, somebody's saying, hey, listen, uh, four weeks ago, I was able to go shopping, no problem. Now I have a hard time opening my car door. Things are moving pretty fast. Now, fortunately, bad things are rare. So if you look at all the people that have spinal cord compression and symptoms, one in 20, so 5%, uh, will have rapid progression. The other 95% have we just call stepwise progression. They have periods where they deteriorate and then periods where they function at that level where they deteriorate. Now remember, the lower you go, the harder it is to get back up uh, to where you are. So recovery is predicated on based on what it is that you had going into surgery. Meaning if you're laying in bed, can't move anything, you have surgery, the chance of you regaining full function is very low. All right? So that's why timing of surgery is very important. Next slide. We can skip this, I don't want to gross people out. Next slide. Yeah. All right, so this is, for those of you who are interested, we can go there, some I'm sure not. So this is the treatment for uh, that particular case. Uh, what you see is a lot of you know white stuff, which is metal, okay, which is what's placed in the spine to stabilize. Anytime you take bones out of the neck, in the back, you can potentially destabilize the spine. Now, not obviously in every instance, but I showed you a woman who had four levels of uh, spinal cord compression, and 
those levels needed to be decompressed, so the pressure needed to be removed, in this case by removing the bones that were pushing on uh, her spiral cord. If I was just to leave her neck, there's a, uh, without the this, this screws and the rods, there's actually a chance that she slowly will develop uh, a sagging chin where the chin rests on the chest. Once again, that's not common, but it is a null complication. Furthermore, people that have uh, this procedure and do not have this, the, the stabilizing effect of the uh, screws and the rods have more neck pain after surgery. Um, so, any questions about this stuff? How common is this? How common is it to be walking around and have problems in your neck and not even knowing about it? So this is a study from Cleveland, I told you it's been six years, or I did not get roped into this one, but what they did, the Cleveland has the biggest bone collection, human bone collection in the world. So people from all the world come there to the Habitat uh, collection and look at and try to answer some questions. In this particular instance, they said, what's the prevalence of narrow um, Canal, so stenosis. We probably should define stenosis. When I'm talking about it. So stenosis just means narrowing of a passage. Okay, um, and in this case, we're referring to the spine. Spinal canal becomes narrow. You can have stenosis in your arteries, arthro, uh, in your uh, heart. So various um, uh, locations can be stenotic uh, or narrow. In this case, we're referring to the spine. So they looked at that. They looked at a bunch of bones. And uh, the next slide, please. And about 10 percent of people. Okay, I'm sorry. Go back. About 10% of people uh, without any symptoms have that, one in 10. Okay? Does that mean that they should all be in the doctor's office and get their next check? No, no. Symptoms dictate uh, management. <coughs> Alright, so this is, when you know this guy as well. Uh, a reason why I get the CAT scan in patients that I'm concerned about. What you see here looks like a big disc herniation on your MRI. Uh, it just doesn't look right to me, so I got a cat. Can you see this white, almost like a teardrop thing? That's all hardened, calcified. It's a bony block. Okay, block of bone. That on the right looks like a big disc image. If I did not get this cancer, and I try to treat this spinal cord compression, which this man had, he actually couldn't even lift his arm above his head, by trying to do a discectomy, so a very standardized procedure, at that point, I would have risked actually pushing this block into the spinal cord and paralyzing it. Okay? So that's why he's not a candidate for that. Uh, next slide, please. It should not be anything too gross. This is him in the uh, recovery room. That's actually a day after surgery. And we don't have a voice, but you know, he could not lift his arm uh, above his uh, head before. So in some, in some instances, there's dramatic effects that are felt right away. The reason I take them is because this is not a typical recovery. Right? So everybody wants to feel better like that, but it usually actually takes months to regain function that you have lost if you recover at all. So you could actually you know, you know, make a uh, show, show his bicep and uh, do that pretty quickly. Next one, please. Uh, I think we have one left. Let's, let's just skip to this one. This Actually, why don't you go back one? Yeah, so this is uh, what I was showing you, is this whiteness in the spinal cord. When you see that, that's concerning. Okay? That means that there's dying nerve cells as a result of compression. There's no blood flow that goes through the spinal cord. People that have this on MRI before their surgical procedure have worse outcomes after surgery. Right? Your chance to bounce back and recover is decreased because, as you know, nerves have a hard time regenerating. The famous Christopher Reeves, you know, of his spinal cord injury, all these things have uh, been done to try to help him, and there's a lot of research that's in, in, you know, in this area, but unfortunately, in 2014, there's nothing that we can do to reverse that in a human, okay? There's some animal studies which you know, are of questionable value. People are not voting. Uh, you know, some of these little mice and rats actually regenerate things on their own, and it's amazing the capability. So, all right, um, next please, Let's skip. This is just a before and after. Once again, so I showed you the big white signal, and this is after surgery, and you can see the white persists in the spinal cord. Okay? This is actually a young woman, a mother of five kids. Uh, she uh, was a gymnast when she was a teen, that she had a, a neck injury, and waited you know, 30, 20 years to get something done, uh, because 
our R was numb. So numb is resolved, some of the function did not come back, and you know, most people are okay with that as long as they know what they're getting themselves into. So I think it's that communication. Next. All right. Well, actually, we think of it. So on the left, this is this big disc herniation here. This is actually the disc. Out of this disc came out this piece and is pushing on the spinal cord. So the goal of the procedure, I told you, is to decompress the spine, so take the pressure off of it. And this is, what you see here is actually the cage, that we use little cages there too, that we took the disc out of it, put something back in. And this egg-shaped structure is the nerve with the spinal cord with no pressure on it. Okay. Next, please. Okay, next one, I got a bother your jaw. Uh, this is the last case example I have. So, uh, Essentially, this is a worker who uh, has a similar problem as the ones I've been showing you before, but I just wanted to show you a different form of treatment. Uh, go forward, please. Go forward. So sometimes they can actually do things, we're talking about minimally invasive. Okay? Everybody wants a minimally invasive procedure, and some of these conditions, uh, and never all, so if you go to a person that only does minimally invasive surgery, you cannot just do only minimally invasive surgery because you're probably doing, not achieving all your goals. The number one thing when you're doing a procedure is you, you want to know what your goals are and how to achieve them. Sometimes mentally invasive certainly works, as in this case I'm going to show you, and sometimes you're not going to achieve your goal, so the patient is going to have a small incision and be in the same condition they were when they started. So uh, these are a sequence of dilators, uh, next please, that are essentially docked on the neck, and you can see uh, these are intraoperative x-rays. Uh, they have these little tubes, uh, next slide please, uh, placed on the neck, and you work under a microscope and uh, the opening is about 20 millimeters, so less than an inch. Uh, next, please. This is what you see, okay? So, what is this? It's a whole bunch of, you know, this is exactly what it looks like. So, when we do, we have residents um, in the operating room of the university, this is what they're looking for. It's very hard to get oriented. So, that's a huge disadvantage of minimally invasive surgeries. If you don't do enough of it, you don't know what you're looking for. Because now things look completely different than what they do when you have this traditional open approach. Next slide, please. So you have to know what you're working with, though, is to get uh, to the disc and to the nerve. Forward. Yeah, forward. Let's click it like four times. One more time. Yeah. So this piece of bone is what needs to get resected. Now you need to know that. Okay. Next slide. And this is what you see after you take all that bone off is the nerve. Okay, so nice, white, and shiny. Very frequently, when you go in on these things, these nerve roots are red, swollen, angry looking. Okay? That's an inflammatory thing, what I can tell you. Next slide, please. Micro instruments, uh, very frequently used for these procedures. Next. And a small incision, which is what every patient wants to see. But the most important thing is, nobody's ever been upset if they feel good after surgery and they have a big incision. Okay? Uh, so, I, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of marketing involved in telling patients you can minimally basic surgery. All right, that's it. Thank you. And then one more slide. Do I need the most excellent? That's the slide we were been waiting for. The last time. Right, I'm way cuter in person. I don't like that picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who gave me the slide.